Thank you for joining us for our program here today at CSIS on the U.S. trade agenda, a look ahead for 2011. I'm not sure I've seen so many trade folks in one room since the WIDA annual dinner. Um, and I'm afraid with the available reception, refreshments, it's going to be a more serious meeting. But nonetheless, I hope you all see some good friends today. Um, on that note, I just wanted to recognize that Ambassador Warren Laverall has passed away, many of you have heard, and we want to just recognize his public service as a Deputy USTR and Deputy Director General at the World Trade Organization. It's a, it's a big loss for all of us. I'm Meredith Broadbent, and I direct the Shoal International Business Program here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Our general orientation is that we see trade agreements and the promotion of commercial relations to be beneficial in projecting the rule of law and U.S. influence around the globe. In addition to their economic benefits, trade agreements can be a strong tool in the President's foreign policy toolkit, but only if you can get on the same page with Congress. Otherwise, I'm afraid we may be doing some damage to our position. With the recent expiration of GSP, Andean trade preferences, and some of the benefits under trade adjustment assistance, trade legislation seems to be facing a long jam in Congress. The lack of forward movement appears to be caused by a disagreement on how the President and Congress will consider three pending free trade agreements. There's a lot more on the agenda to be done, just to name a few, resolving the NAFTA dispute on Me uh, with Mexico on trucking, increasing our competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis China, and working out definitive positions for the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations in the sensitive areas. PNT, PNTR for Russia is an issue. And finally, there's a question about what to do about the Doha Round. How do you solve a problem like the Doha Round? That's a question I think the panelists will talk about today. We are honored to have six former USTRs, all in one continent in the same day, to be with us to lay out the pr priorities that they see for action on the trade agenda. I should mention for the electronic audience, the United States Trade Representative is a cabinet level official with the rank of ambassador who is directly responsible to the President and to Congress for U.S. trade policy. Represented here is a span of 30 years of U.S. trade policy. Which is also our aging. <laughs> They're not seated in any chronological order, I assure you. Don't we <laughs> We're missing, there's the quiz question is which one are we missing? And unfortunately it's Ambassador Canner, which he tried everything he could to, to rearrange his schedule and just wasn't able to make it, so we hope to host him here again, and we're going to miss his perspective, um, but we we'll hope we'll catch up with that. Um, we hope today's discussion will result in some practical suggestions on how to move the trade agenda forward. I've asked each panelist to address a few selected topics with the understanding that the trade agenda is so full that we're not going to be able to do justice to all the major issues. I think they'll stay seated in their, in their seats and not come to the podium so we can get through things as quickly as possible. And I'm encouraging them to comment on each other's presentations as they feel inclined to do so. And then we'll turn to the audience for questions. Senator Portman from Ohio has agreed to join us at about uh, 10.30, 10.40, depending on traffic. So please allow us to interrupt the program for him. And then we'll take up uh, with the presentations uh, where we left off. With that, I'll briefly introduce our panel. The, the longer bios are available to you in the room. Carla Hills is chairman and CEO of Hills & Company. Ambassador Hills served as U.S. Trade Representative from 1989 to 1993 in the administration of George H.W. Bush and negotiated NAFTA and the Uruguay Round. She currently is chair of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and of the Inter-American Dialogue. She is co-chair of the advisory board here at CSIS, as well as one of our trustees. Ambassador Susan Schwab is a strategic advisor with Mayor Brown, Government and Global Trade Practice, and a professor of public policy at the University of Maryland. She served at USTR from 2006 to 2009 in the George W. Bush administration, 
where she negotiated four FTAs and achieved congressional approval of permanent normal trade relations with Vietnam and the bipartisan so-called May 10th deal on trade, which ad addresses some of the sensitive issues of labor and environment. She also negotiated the U.S. bilateral WTO accession agreement with Russia. Ambassador Charlene Barshevsky is Wil Wilmer Hale's senior international partner. She served as USTR from 1997 to 2001. She was chief negotiator of China's WTO agreement, as well as for global agreements in many sectors and areas, including financial services, telecommunications, high technology products, and intellectual property rights. Ambassador Yeider practices international trade and agriculture law at Hogan and Lovells. He served as USTR from 1985 to 1989 in the Reagan administration, where he negotiated the U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement and launched the Uruguay Round, which broadened global negotiations to include services, intellectual property, and agriculture for the first time. In 1989, Ambassador Yeider was named Secretary of Agriculture. In, in that post, he steered the 1990 Farm Bill through Congress. He's also served as President and CEO of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Ambassador William, Senator William Brock, is a counselor and a trustee of CSIS. He served four terms as a member of Congress from Tennessee and subsequently in the U.S. Senate. He was in USTR in the Reagan administration. He was at USTR in the Reagan administration from 1981 to 1985. And he also served as President Reagan's Secretary of Labor. He is chairman of the Brock Offices, a firm specializing in international trade, investment, and human resources. With that, um, we can go to the opening statements, starting with Ambassador Hills, and we'll go down the line. And again, thank you very much for coming. Well, thank you, Meredith, and thank you for gathering us all together. This is a superb reunion. Uh, you'll hear from my colleagues on uh, uh, the pending FTAs on uh, China, on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, on the currency. So Meredith said, well, why don't you talk about the U.S. role in trade, both historically and as we look forward. And looking back for 60 years under both Democratic and Republican administrations, the, the United States has led on trade, starting with the first uh, global trade round with a gap in 1947 through the uh, creation in 95 of the World Trade Organization and the launch uh, in, uh, uh, in 2001 of the Doha Round, none of that would have occurred or be successful without the United States. And the results have been spectacular for both rich and poor nations. Most of you have heard of Dr. Gary Huffbauer's study that shows that the United States is $1 trillion per year better off by reason of our opening of markets since World War II. But it's not only the rich countries that are better off, but it's also the poor countries, countries like China that have lifted 400 million people out of poverty by opening their markets. And we're talking about the need to generate growth today. And to generate growth, the United States must again take the lead on trade, working with a larger group of nations than we've had to work with in the past. Two decades ago, the United States, Canada, the European Union, and Japan, the so-called Quad, could meet once a year, thrash out their differences, and there were differences, serious differences. But if they could come to an agreement, then the rest of the world would normally come along. And that's changed. There has been a shift so that uh, uh, we now have to work with a much larger group of nations, developing nations. Uh, many uh, emerging nations uh, are growing much more rapidly than the industrialized nations, and their contribution to trade growth is also exceeding that of the, uh, uh, of the uh, Western world. And growth is particularly strong in China, and you'll hear about China, but also on the BRICS, Brazil, is a key partner and uh, offers us some tools to deal with the issues. Many emerging markets see the United States' position on agriculture as a key to them, as, um, and uh, that our position has been stubbornly an impediment to moving forward. Br Brazil this week said, I'm not going to move one step further unless the United States 
takes a more reasonable position on its farm subsidies. So I ask you, as, far, as the Congress begins to focus on the Farm Bill of 2013, with the budget deficit for 2011 hitting $1.5 trillion, trillion dollars, that uh, could we possibly think of how we might table an offer that would deal with farm subsidies in a market where commodities are soaring, the prices of commodities are soaring, and the prices for those commodities that get 90% of our subsidies, namely corn, cotton, wheat, and soya, 90% they get are, uh, I heard this morning on WTOP that uh, the corn prices this year are up 87%. Could we make an offer to reduce that, uh, our subsidies, and in so doing, strengthen our fiscal circumstance, galvanize the negotiations at Doha, spur development of the poorest countries that rely disproportionately on agriculture to feed their people, and enhance our security? I think we could. And with leadership, we could also take a hard look at our tariff structure. It's tough to argue that the United States is committed to development when our tariffs are 15 to 20 percent higher, 50, if, excuse me, 15 to 20 times higher on the poorest countries of the world. The three largest poor Muslim countries, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and Pakistan, each with 100 million people living below the poverty line, pay multiples in tariffs than do the richest countries of the world. An illustration is Bangladesh pays the United States $120 million on $3 billion of exports. France, uh, $120 billion more than France does on $3 billion worth of exports. And France sells us $37 billion in exports. Also, we talk about the rule of law. Indeed, some say we lecture about the rule of law. But uh, when our cotton subsidies were found to violate our WTO commitments, allowing Brazil to impose $830 million in WTO cross-retaliation, instead of fixing the system, we, uh, th and that system that we have in place hurts the four poorest West African countries, we agreed to pay Brazil on the side. Some said it was a bribe. $147 million a year. And just this past week, we've agreed that this year we'll do it all over again. So with worries about food shortage, I would say leadership is not demonstrated by our 45 cent per gallon tax credit to U.S. producers of corn-based uh, ethanol and levying in addition a 54 cent per gallon tariff on Brazil's more efficient sugar-based ethanol. With leadership, I suspect there's a deal there to be made. And there's so many areas uh, between uh, the United States and Brazil, the largest economies in North America and South America, that we ought to reach out and see what we could put together. Globalization has made uh, uh, supply chains encircle the world, and the gains that come from opening markets have also been multiplied. Others see that. The WTO reports 371 regional trade agreements that uh, have been uh, signed. The United States has 17 and one in process, uh, the, which you'll hear about today. And without taking the lead in opening markets, our producers and our workers are disadvantaged. The report of the World Economic Forum ranks 125 nations in terms of the impediments, the trade impediments, that their producers face. And just taking one, tariffs. And tariffs are not the only problem, but they're a big problem still today. Uh, we, uh, uh, Chile, by comparison, comes in number one, protected by their network of free trade agreements. The United States comes in at 114. 113 of our competitive nations face a better tariff system than we do. 
And uh, I think that we see that uh, across the board. Uh, you know, the uh, Columbia, for example, we were uh, increasing our exports on agriculture to Columbia 38% per year for the five years leading up to 2008. Since they signed trade agreements, our exports on wheat, corn, soy, and soy oil have, have plummeted 68%. So we better get off the dime if we want to double exports and create jobs for our workers. And to do that, I argue, the United States must step out, step in front, and be a leader. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to uh, speak briefly about a different negotiation, <clears throat> namely uh, the negotiation between the executive branch and the Congress over the pending free trade agreements. Uh, the fundamental issue, uh, because this is one fraught with irony, bad feelings, and unfortunately increasing mistrust, uh, the fundamental issue is how do uh, the administration and the congressional leadership, the Republican leadership in the House, uh, Democrats and Republicans uh, in the Senate, do what I would argue the vast majority realize we could and should do, which is pass the free trade agreements, pending free trade agreements with Colombia, Panama, and South Korea. At the point that they were negotiated, the point they were signed, they were very, very important to the United States. They would have uh, opened markets of 100 million consumers to U.S. exports. Uh, they would have put U.S. exporters in a preferential position vis-a-vis uh, -vis our trading partners with Colombia, with Panama, with South Korea. Uh, we've now had four years almost five years pass, these free trade agreements are more important than ever, uh, but now just as much for defensive reasons as for offensive affirmative reasons, uh, which is a sad commentary. Um, as Carla noted, uh, between Canada's free trade agreements and the EU's free trade agreements and other countries' free trade agreements uh, with these countries, we now find ourselves, U.S. commercial interests, small, medium, large businesses, agriculture, services, uh, at a competitive disadvantage or certainly a potential competitive disadvantage. Uh, and therefore, time is even more, uh, uh, working even more against us than ever. And, and one would note that if you're serious about doubling U.S. exports, uh, there is no faster way uh, and no more certain way, and I'm looking at my my ITC friends sitting over there, based on the, uh, the uh, uh, studies done by the International Trade Commission, we know that all three, the passage and implementation of all three free trade agreements, will generate increased U.S. exports, uh, both in absolute terms and in you know, gross terms and in net uh, terms. And from the um, commentaries that we have heard from the White House, I think it's fairly safe to say that they also recognize this and would like to see these free trade agreements enacted into law. Combine that with the fact that certainly when uh, we were in office, the votes were there, certainly for passage of the Colombia and Panama agreements. Uh, I like to think the votes were there for passage of the South Korea agreement, but that was a little dicier, and I, you know, commend the Obama folks for um, doing what they have done with the South Korea agreement um, uh, in a way that has generated more widespread support, and I think clearly a consensus that if there were a vote today, uh, it would go through. But the votes are also there for the Colombia and Panama agreements, and have been there uh, all along, and anyone who raised questions about that as recently as yesterday saying, oh my, the, you know, we don't know about the Tea Partiers, which way are they going to vote? Uh, there is a marvelous letter that, that most of you here in this audience are aware of, signed by 67 of the freshmen who've come in favoring passage of all three free trade agreements as quickly as possible. 
And so the obvious question is, what are we waiting for? Uh, in the case of the Colombia and Panama free trade agreements, both of those countries have had virtually unlimited access to the U.S. market since the early 1990s by virtue of one-way preference programs. One-way preference programs, by the way, that have been in our interest as well uh, in terms of the war on drugs, uh, Planned Colombia, a whole variety of, of, of reasons. Um, but these are countries that have said and have put their, you know, signed on the dotted line that they're willing to totally open their markets to U.S. exports. And so the obvious question is, how can we move ahead as expeditiously as possible uh, to get this done? And why are we waiting? And I would say the only real culprit, ironically, to a broad bipartisan endorsement of all three agreements is a trust deficit. I mean, it's sort of ironic. Both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, I would argue, want pretty much the same thing. And yet what you hear uh, from one end of Pennsylvania Avenue is, oh my, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, too partisan and the Republicans are trying to do this to create a wedge within the Democratic Party. In fact, there was, there were sufficient votes, both Republican and Democrat, uh, in 2007, in 2008, to get these bills done, uh, to get these agreements through. Uh, there are sufficient votes today. Um, 2007, 2008, as most of you know, it was solely the Democratic leadership in the House uh, refusing to act on these bills that prevented what would have been, arguably, have been a clear bipartisan majority. Um, I'm not going to dwell on the the May 10 Accord, other than to say, uh, for those of you, maybe the two and a half of you in this very, <laughs> very uh, up-to-date audience who may not be aware of the May 10, 2007 agreement, it was an effort on the part of the Bush administration working with the Speaker of the House and the Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, um, then Rahm Emanuel, Nancy Pelosi, Charlie Rangel, Sandy Levin, and others, uh, to try to meet some of the concerns that had been articulated for many years about insufficient uh, labor and environmental provisions within our free trade agreements. And pursuant to uh, our discussions with them in an effort to get all four of the pending free trade agreements done, at that point the Peru FTA was also pending, um, we reached an accord to include those provisions. Um, it's a solid set of provisions. They are in all three free trade agreements. And what we learned, sadly, was that the folks who had been calling for all of these changes over the years uh, suddenly decided they had other reasons to oppose the free trade agreements. And so my caution to the administration is if you are waiting for the anti-trade constituencies uh, to change their minds on Colombia and Panama, uh, you're going to be waiting a very long time, and I would argue much too long, uh, for the commercial interests uh, of, of uh, uh, the U.S. economy. And let us note most clearly that if we care about small, medium-sized companies involved in trade, they are the ones that are hurt the most when there are trade barriers barriers at the border, when there are tariffs that don't necessarily need to be there. Major multinationals can, if necessary, invest behind tariff walls. The small and medium-sized companies cannot, and therefore, arguably, the eight to 9,000 small and medium-sized firms that do business or could do business in Colombia uh, are damaged every day that those tariffs remain in place, and the Colombians have told us very clearly uh, they would like to eliminate those tariffs. For those who say that, well, uh, the uh, problem is violence in Colombia, uh, there is a great deal of data available to show that, one, there's been incredible alleviation of violence in Colombia. In part, it has been because of trade and investment. Uh, and if we really care about uh, continuing, helping Colombia continue that trend, uh, enacting the free trade agreement is the single best way of doing it. When the Washington Post travel section has a front page section on, on tourism in Medellin, uh, you have to wonder why <laughs> there are those 
who are saying there is too much <laughs> violence uh, in Colombia for us to have unfettered access to their market. Let me close with a quick comment um, then about uh, Russia PNTR, the other uh, point that, that I was asked to, to raise. November 2006 is when the bilateral, uh, when we signed the bilateral with Russia uh, on their accession to the World Trade Organization. Uh, I think all of us, or certainly I would say, uh, Russia belongs in the WTO when Russia is prepared to act like a WTO member. Uh, and there is uh, evidence that um, Russia has come to the table increasingly in good faith on these issues. Uh, progress is finally being made in Geneva. Uh, there is evidence on commitment that commitments made in intellectual property, uh, SPS issues that have been very problematic, uh, sanitary, phytosanitary issues uh, involving uh, U.S. agricultural exports, that we have finally gotten some traction. Uh, and uh, it will be important that when Russia joins the WTO, that the United States is part of the process embracing that. And as you all know here, that will entail uh, action on the part of Congress, and it will be a heavy lift. Closing, uh, the irony on all of the four pieces of legislation that I've addressed, they have the potential for huge bipartisan endorsement, Republican and Democrat. Uh, executive and legislative branch at a point where there isn't a whole lot that these folks are agreeing on, uh, but it's going to take serious reaching out and everyone taking some risks um, and leaning forward to get the job done. So, thank you. Leadership. Thanks very much. I apologize for my cold. <laughs> Let's shift gears <clears throat> for a moment. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, China, which uh, in itself uh, on trade grounds, economic grounds, foreign policy grounds, and almost every other ground you can think of is really the issue for the United States uh, as we uh, look ahead. And what I'll do is just give you a bit of contextual background for the politics of uh, U.S. politics of trade, globalization, and the inevitable China discussion, uh, the effects of the forces that are shaping U.S. politics and U.S. perceptions generally, and a couple of uh, thoughts in conclusion. So first of all, simply contextually, I think we're seeing the convergence in an unfortunate way of four broad trends which affect uh, the politics of our relationships with China, which affect what we demand of China and China's sometimes lackadaisical response, and uh, which affect public perceptions. First broad trend is the acceleration of the pace of globalization, even with the global financial meltdown, uh, and tighter uh, global economic integration. 7,500 multinational corporations 35 years ago, more than 75,000 multinational corporations today. You look at the U.S. financial uh, meltdown, uh, and what do you see in terms of global trade? A reduction in global trade very near the levels we saw during the Great Depression of the 1930s. The, and there are many other factors I could point to, but the point is, with respect to this first broad trend, the global economy is larger, it's growing faster. It is more integrated economically under the pressures of technology and capital flows than ever before in any historic sense. And this is uh, itself presents fundamental challenges for all countries, for all countries, and fundamental opportunities. Second broad trend is the reemergence of China and the integration of Asia around China as its hub. I always use the word reemergence with respect to China because 160 years ago, the global economy was dominated by two countries, China and India. And China held over 30% of the world's GDP. By comparison today, we hold 18, 
19 percent of the world's GDP, maybe. They're over 30 percent. So the reemergence of China. This has created a structural shift in the global economy. It is the international economic story of our lifetimes uh, in this room. The reemergence of China stems from two broad factors. One is their own process of internal opening and reform started by Deng Xiaoping more than 30 years ago, uh, combined with geoeconomics, or sorry, geopolitics. And that is the reintegration of Asia by diplomatic means initially, not economic, diplomatic means through the normalization of relations between China and its five wealthiest Asian neighbors. And that normalization took place between roughly 1972, when we also began to normalize relations with China, 72 being also Japan, uh, and uh, the mid-1990s. And so as you look geopolitically at China's wealthiest Asian neighbors, you see a cadence of Japan normalizing post-war and post, or nearly post, uh, the Mao era, three years before Mao uh, left the scene, but still. Uh, Japan uh, normalizing. You saw uh, Korea normalizing relations. You saw subsequently Taiwan. You saw Hong Kong's reversion to China uh, and Singapore. These five wealthy Asian nations, given the normalization of relations to China, given China's historic role in the region, have allowed China to combine the following. Money and technology from the five wealthy Asian nations, large labor reserves and low cost from a relatively far poorer China. And it is the combination of those factors and China's own, as I said, internal reform and opening, and then capped by China's WTO accession which radically broadened and deepened the opening of China's uh, market as a worldwide market that have created the reemergence of China. It is the uh, outcome that you see uh, today. So what are the results of that reemergence? Uh, China's economy is larger now than Japan's and Germany's, far smaller than ours, and on a per capita GDP basis, China is a poor country still. But in total size, it outpaces Japan and Germany. This is almost inconceivable when one considers the China of 15 years ago, let alone the China of Deng Xiaoping. It's had a, an average growth rate of 7.5% over the course of 30 years, much higher growth rate now. It'll come down a bit, but it is extremely robust. It is also extremely economic res economically resilient, as we saw in the global financial uh, meltdown. It has integrated with its Asian neighbors, far less important than trade agreements between them, is the fact that these economies have reverted to a more historic pattern in Asia, a pattern with which we're unfamiliar, but a pattern with which we would have been familiar had we lived 200 years ago or 1,000 years ago, 2,000, 4,000 years ago. So this is a very different, uh, hey Rob, a very different situation. You want to stop? I'll stop for a minute so you can introduce our. Excuse me. Don't stop, Charlie. What do you want you to say? <laughs> no, 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 please. Yeah, we want to give you the time. Can you make yeah. it up there because there are some steps over here. Why don't you introduce Rob? I'm going to yeah. introduce Senator Portman so he can get back to the hill where he came from. <laughs> he came from the house. <laughs> <laughs>
He turned off my microphone even, Meredith. <laughs> she really wants to get me back to the Hill. Um, turn off a senator's microphone and they leave immediately. Uh, it's interesting because they asked you to give the response to the, the president's address. And so I said, great, it's really terrific. I can't wait to hear what he has to say and I'll be happy to respond to it. And then they informed me, no, actually, you're recording it on Wednesday, and he's giving his on Saturday. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure it was very responsive, but uh, it was, shall we say, proactive, um, the preemptive radio address. That's a little secret. Don't tell anybody about that, OK, because no one else knows it. Um, listen, I thank you all very much for having me here today. And, and Meredith, as you may know, had to work with me at the Ways and Means Committee and then uh, I hired her when I was at U.S. Trade Rep's office. She was uh, one of the assistant U.S. Trade Reps in a critical area, including industry. Um, and uh, it's great to see her here and great to see uh, CSIS taking such a leadership role. I, I thank you for that. I'd like to hear what all of my friends have to say uh, to my right. Um, they were great advisors to me when I was at USTR. And as they, each of them know, I, I relied on them and turned to them. Um, so to Ambassador Hills and Varshevsky and uh, Yeider, Brock, and Schwab, uh, I thank you for your counsel. For Susan, uh, I really leaned on her because she was uh, the deputy uh, when I was USTR. And if I ever looked good in the office, it was probably because of Susan, uh, because things like the Swiss formula. <laughs> By the way, I'm Swiss American, so that was sort of why that ended up being Swiss. Don't tell the minister from Switzerland. Uh, but um, but uh, it's great to have Susan continue uh, to give me counsel, as uh, these other distinguished uh, public servants have, have done. And Brock even checked out uh, elected politics for a while. So uh, he can tell you that, uh, and survived to tell the story. Uh, he can tell you that the, those numbers in Ohio that Meredith talked about, uh, frankly, were not because of my positions on trade. Um, <laughs> Maybe you could say in spite of. Um, but, you know, the, the point I kept making on the campaign trail was really very simple, you know, because the, the reporters would often ask me about my position on trade and wasn't I going to change it. And I said, no, you know, the, the position I have on trade is the right position for Ohio workers and Ohio farmers and Ohio service providers. It's the wrong position politically. I understand that. And there's going to be a process here of, you know, in my case, two years talking about on the campaign trail and, and, and trying to explain the the reason the trade was so important for Ohio. Uh, but that process continues, obviously. And the people in this room who understand trade, care about it, need to stay out there on point on that issue. And we have some great ambassadors here, in the purest sense of the word, um, who are doing it every day. And we've got to keep it up, because this is so critical at a time when our country faces some, some very big challenges. Those challenges uh, you know, on the Hill are being talked about mostly in, in budget terms. And let's face it, we have a fiscal time bomb at our doorstep, and that, that crisis is, is, I think, quickly going to affect our economy in negative ways if we don't take steps. Uh, but it's really a broader issue of whether the U.S. role in the world is going to continue to be preeminent. And trade can play an incredibly important role. So um, that's one reason I'm, I'm glad that so many of uh, my distinguished uh, predecessors and successors agreed to come today and that we have such a great turnout here, and I hope some good coverage of this, because we need to bring trade up to the forefront in terms of that economic issue. Um, USTR uh, was a terrific experience, and I, I wish, frankly, that I'd been able to stay there a little bit longer. Um, when I took the job, I was a little hesitant because, as Meredith said, I, I had a safe district. I was in the House leadership. Things were going pretty, pretty well, um, and um, I thought, frankly, going to USTR probably would mean that uh, I wouldn't be back in elected politics again. Um, <laughs> But uh, I love being there, and I love working with the professionals there. Uh, the career people there are, are, are the best, and the best and brightest are attracted to that agency. That continues to be true, by the way. And uh, Ambassador Kirk and I talk fairly frequently. Um, he is not here today, couldn't be here today, but uh, there are probably some folks in the room f uh, from USTR, and uh, uh, they do day in and day out really important work on the enforcement side and on the trade opening side. And I, I am always going to uh, look back fondly on my experience there. As I noted, uh, over the past couple years, I've been more on the political side. And, and we have visited uh, over 80 factories in Ohio in the last 24 months. 
And I've had countless uh, small business roundtables and meetings with economic development folks, our campaign focused on jobs and the economy. And I just can't tell you how many times I would walk into a factory uh, having gotten, you know, the best briefing I could and found out that trade plays an even more important role than, than I thought and certainly than uh, the public knew. Let me give you a couple of, experience, of, of examples of that. Uh, just in the last uh, several weeks, I've been in northern Ohio at a couple of plants that, uh, you know, people would acknowledge are important Ohio employers but would not understand the importance that trade plays in having those jobs there. One is the Whirlpool washing machine factory in Clyde, Ohio, which I'm sure you've all heard of, but it is the world's largest washing machine factory in northern Ohio, in this Rust Belt state, in this state that continually is talked about as being part of the spearhead of the Industrial Revolution but has been left behind. Here we are making washing machines for the world. And in fact, I learned that day that 25 percent of the washing machines that I saw being made were being exported. I also learned, incidentally, that in the last two years it's one of the handful of companies in Ohio that's actually added workers rather than having to go through a painful layoff. And why? Because they've expanded exports. Even during the recession, they were able to find new markets for their product because of U.S. technology, because, frankly, of some very hard work uh, on behalf of, in that case, the workers and management to come up with more efficiencies. And uh, this is an untold story. Um, on that same trip, I visited the famous uh, Toledo Jeep factory, where they make the Wrangler, and, and it's a really exciting place. It's a, it's a UAW plant. Um, and upon leaving there, I asked, as I always do, about the export side of things. Twenty-four percent of these Jeep Wranglers were being exported. And Fiat, uh, which now plays a central role in Chrysler and therefore Jeep, is looking to expand even further. And I think there's a huge market in Europe um, with a few modifications to the product. So uh, this is the reality. It's what's going on. And it's not surprising, I guess, because we know the, the aggregate figures. In Ohio, 25 percent of factory jobs are now export jobs. Think about that. A quarter of the jobs in Ohio that are in a factory are there because there is an export. One out of every three acres planted in Ohio is now planted for export. So when you talk to farmers about their prices, <laughs> they're really happy to have those markets, aren't they? Uh, and Clayton, having been Secretary of Agriculture and USTR, you know, that's been consistent over the years. We have a huge competitive advantage there. Um, we need to do even more. If you look at the data on the amount that we export as a percentage of our GDP compared to our trading partners, um, we're at the bottom of the heap in terms of developed countries. In fact, we're even below a lot of emerging economies in that regard. So there's much more potential and much more opportunity to create more of those jobs. Um, the best way to immediately grow exports, I believe, is through these trade opening agreements. And they can be regional, they can be bilateral, um, but this is the way for us to make the most progress most quickly. Uh, I, I'm continually hopeful about Doha. Um, however, <laughs> it's been a long time. Um, I don't have to tell those of you who have been following it or working on it. Uh, in the meantime, let's make progress and move ahead. And what's so frustrating to me is that over the last several years, you know, we've been standing still while other countries have been negotiating agreements, taking market share from us. And again, we're not exporting enough already. We need to do more. It's critical to our economic growth. As I said at the outset, it's critical to our fiscal uh, health for us to get the economy back on track and to really start creating more jobs and therefore a bigger tax base. And uh, the quickest way to do it is through exports. I think you all know these numbers already, but when you look at the countries with which we have a trade opening agreement, and this, of course, includes significantly Canada and Mexico, but also Central American countries, Australia and so on, Singapore. It's only about 15 percent of global GDP, probably between 12 and 14 percent, actually. So it's a relatively small part of the world. And yet we send over 40 percent of our exports to those countries. So when people say, gee, do these agreements really work? Well, yeah, they, they do. They give us the competitive advantage because they allow us to have a more level playing field. So you look at the CAFTA Accord. When I landed at USTR, it was on the shelf waiting for me. And it wasn't in very good shape on the Hill. Um, people told me my first day on the job that we were about 50 votes short on passing CAFTA. Um, it was a tough slog. In the end, I think we got 15 Democrats in the House after I met with about 150 of them. So it wasn't very good batting average. Um, <laughs> But that was necessary to get the agreement passed. And um, 
you look at what's happened. I mean, uh, again, these trade agreements are tough to get through and the politics are not good, but the reality is that it makes a huge difference. In 2005, when we were negotiating that agreement, we had a trade deficit with those five countries in Central America and, and the DR. And today we have a trade surplus. Um, it was a $1.2 billion deficit in 2005. It got up to a $6 billion surplus by 2008. Now it's less than that. It's still a surplus but because of the recession. Uh, exports are down. But the point is these things work. And we need to get that story out there more, by the way, and do more follow-up as to what happens when we complete these agreements. Uh, they also work in, in other ways, as you all know, which is to open up those economies, move them toward the very market economies that we're promoting around the world, and have tremendous geopolitical advantages, which, of course, we're going to see if we can get the uh, Republic of Korea and Colombian and Panamanian agreements completed. Um, we are losing market share every day by not moving ahead with these agreements. I'm sure you all have good examples of that. Let me give you one that, that I'm talking about a lot, and that's Colombia. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, President Uribe came to Washington and negotiated directly uh, with me, which meant he had to deal with Susan Schwab. Um, and we negotiated a heck of an agreement. And commercially, this opens up markets that were you know, never imagined on the ag side, on the manufactured side, certainly for protecting intellectual property and for other, uh, again, opening up of their market, uh, not just to our products, but to make them a more free market country. In 2008, the United States had a 71 percent market share in Colombia for exports of corn, wheat, and soybeans. Those happen to be important products from Ohio. Um, in 2010, we have a 27 percent market share in Colombia for those same products. Now, these are this is the import market share for agriculture. Um, other countries have taken that market share. And as you know, the Europeans are about to complete an agreement with Colombia. The Canadian agreement is about to be ratified. Uh, those numbers will go down even further. So we've, we've got this very difficult political climate. I understand that. But we've also got this overriding need for us to improve our economy. This is a way to do it. And in the meantime, we're not just not making gains. We're actually losing market share and therefore losing jobs here in this country. Every day we wait, we're stuck in neutral, and we're losing ground. Uh, I did, as Meredith said, introduce legislation uh, calling on Congress to pass these pending trade agreements and also giving the President trade promotion authority. I think it's critical uh, that this President have the negotiating authority to be able to sit across the table and start to get back engaged in the business of creating American jobs through trade. Uh, and as each one of these former trade representatives can tell you, it is impossible to sit down and complete an agreement without having the ability to say there will be an up or down vote in Congress on this agreement. No one's going to put their last and best offer on the table. It's just the way it works. It works in each of your businesses. For those of you who have been in trade negotiations, you know what I'm talking about. But for those of you who have negotiated a contract or been otherwise engaged in, in, on the business side, uh, you've got to have that ability to say this agreement's not going to be picked apart and your best offer that you put on the table removed and exposing you as a trade negotiator uh, without trade promotion authority. So it's critical that we give it to President Obama. Uh, based on what the President and his cabinet have said recently, it sounds like uh, we may have a basis to move forward on some of these agreements. Um, I'm very hopeful, of course, that we can do it and do it very quickly. Um, I've got three kids and they're all in school and to me it's like studying for exams. Waiting to work on the agreements only makes it harder. You know. <laughs> Procrastinating isn't going to make it any better. Um, so my, my, my hope is that the President's serious about moving Korea, Colombia, and Panama, and moving them as quickly as possible. By the way, Congress is ready for it. Um, some of you in the uh, trade media have talked to me about you know, whether the environment is different on the Republican side now, and specifically have said to me, gee, with all these Tea Party Republicans getting elected in the House and some in the Senate, you know, does this mean that Republicans have changed their views on trade? Uh, no, it doesn't, because Republicans and Democrats alike are focused on jobs today. And when you make this case for jobs, and again, the politics can be tough, but when you make this, this case for jobs, it is so compelling. Let me give you an example of that. This week, there was a letter sent by House Republicans who are freshmen, which would be kind of the Tea Party group, I suppose, 
67 of 87 House Republican freshmen signed a letter calling on President Obama to move forward on all three of these agreements. That excuse is off the table. We need to move forward. Uh, on the enforcement side, we need to be sure that we are enforcing those laws that are currently on the books. Um, we need to be sure that international rules are being adhered to. I'm particularly concerned about China, uh, continue to be. Uh, I still believe China is not playing by the rules. And we need to be, those of us who believe in trade, speaking up on this. We can't be shy about it. So um, I think China is manipulating their currency. I think we ought to deal with that issue honestly and openly. And I know there are disagreements as to what the right tactics might be. Uh, but the fact is that we need to deal with that issue because it does affect trade. Uh, we also need to work on other issues with China, including their indigenous innovation policies, of course, transshipment issues, and intellectual property rights enforcement. Meredith indicated there's still some enforcement actions working through that started uh, when I was at USTR on IPR. So I believe that you know, enforcement and trade opening goes hand in hand. The day that uh, Senator Lieberman and I introduced the legislation I talked to you about, I also signed a letter on an anti-dumping issue with China. And uh, I don't think it's inconsistent at all. In fact, I think it is only logical that we ask for a, a level playing field in enforcement, just as we're asking for one in terms of our export markets. So again, thank you all very much for allowing me to come today to speak a little about these issues and to be with this distinguished group. Um, I think our economy facing these huge challenges needs trade. Uh, we need to use every tool available to create American jobs. And I think growing exports is, in many respects, the power tool in our economic toolbox. Why? Because it can be done immediately. We will create hundreds of thousands of jobs very quickly if we simply move forward with these existing trade opening agreements, give the President the ability to negotiate new agreements, and get those through the process as well. Thank you all very much. have a pressing question in the audience for Senator Portman. Any questions, please? Huh, I've got one. Yes, yes sir. So just, I'll just speak up. Yeah, all difficult questions will go to Susan, which is <laughs> the way we did it. <laughs> yes, sir. Right, Kristen, also, and also important. Thank you so much. Yeah. My daughter went to the College of Worcester. Thank you for all that. Awesome. Oh, we love it. Great. Greatest colleges and universities in the country, right? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, sorry, Chris Nelson, Nelson Report. Um, you're, you're home down on something that I was planning to ask the panel, because what's so frustrating for a, a trade reporter, especially a Democrat, you know, we, numbers, trade, it's hard, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you get into job numbers. Mm -hmm. Every time I put in my report, the, the job multipliers, I get a blast from my friend Alan Tomlinson, a fellow Yankee fan, mm -hmm. and my friend's Economic Policy Institute to say, Chris, you're only counting with one hand. You're not counting the jobs that are lost because of Chinese unfair trade practices, yeah, then they throw the Fred Bergsten's, you know, however many million jobs are going to be created by the currency reform, you know, numbers at me. And, and I'm not saying they're right, but people like me who have to write about this stuff need to hear from you about the, the other side of the equation, the jobs that are being lost. What are we doing about that? Mm -hmm. And so I was glad that in, in your talk, you're talking a lot about the, the jobs that we're getting, but I, uh, we need to hear more about what's lost because I think that goes to the heart of the political paralysis, particularly on the Democratic side, but they go home and they get clobbered. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, great, great question. And I, I'd like to hear from uh, our, our panel who have thought about this a lot also. But trade um, does create dislocations, no question about it. And sometimes it's an entire community, often it's a, it's a, it's a company. Um, net, trade adds jobs. And I can give you lots of data on it, but really you, you just sort of think about it logically. I mean, here we are, a big open country. We have a little protectionism here in this country, but relative to the rest of the world, we're a big open free country, aren't we? And other countries around the world, including developed countries, look at the European agricultural practices, for instance, um, in terms of their, their trade re restrictions, certainly in the emerging markets, have relatively high barriers to trade. Some are tariffs, some are non-tariff barriers. So by leveling that playing field and promoting an aggressive trade opening agreement, we will add jobs here because we will get more opportunities. As I said, we export less than other countries already. We need to export more relative to our GDP. And these, these numbers are pretty clear. Again, less than 15 percent of global GDP represented by all of these trade opening agreements that we've negotiated, and yet it's over 40 percent of our exports. So that's the obvious plus on the, the trade side. 
Uh, I also mentioned enforcement for a reason. We need to do both. And yes, I, I do believe that some of the trade practices of some of our trading partners is hurting our economy and affecting trade and therefore hurting jobs in this country. And we need to keep that pressure on. But it doesn't mean that we don't move forward with the trade opening side. You need to do both. Uh, we also need to do a better job, and I think uh, CSS is a good example of an entity that does this. Uh, there are other groups out there. You mentioned Fred Burks, and Fred's been good on this. We need to get these numbers out there to be able to counter some of the misinformation that's out there that often is hurting the very workers uh, who are being represented by some of these groups uh, that say trade is bad. Uh, you know, tr trade is not something that uh, should be a political issue, in my view, a partisan issue. It should be one based on those numbers. And if we get those numbers out there, I think we'll have much more success in moving these agreements forward. Having said all this, by the way, if the Columbia Agreement, the Panamanian Agreement, the Korean Agreement were on the floor of the House or Senate tomorrow, in my view, they would pass. So this notion that we're not moving forward with these agreements because there's not the political will in Congress, I think is just wrong. And that's one reason I wanted to mention the GOP freshman letter. Um, I think because of the trade advantages, the commercial advantages, and because of the geopolitical advantages in all three of these agreements, I think there would be tremendous support. Rob, can I uh, move to the larger question of not just job losses, but of U.S. competitiveness? It seems to me that the, the larger problem uh, is on our side of the aisle, uh, and not political aisle as a nation, in that we don't talk enough about how do we become more competitive as a country. How do we give our, our industries, our services, uh, the, the opportunity to be competitive? Our tax policy, our regulatory policy. Uh, it seems to me that there's some opportunities here that could advance the trade agenda if we would crank those into the conversation. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right, Bill. And that, that's something that uh, we need to focus on, again, not as Republicans, but as Americans, because we are in this increasingly competitive global environment and we have to reform our taxes. The President's talked about it. You know, we now have the second highest corporate tax rate among the developed world, uh, soon to be the highest because Japan is lowering theirs. Uh, this does drive jobs overseas as compared to being here. And of course, our regulatory environment, our energy uh, policy, our health care policy uh, makes us less competitive. So you're right, those are all related and directly related to us being able to compete and take advantage of the trade policies that we, we implement, including these trade opening agreements. Um, I'm going to run back to the hill where Meredith wants me. Um, <laughs> It was, it was sort of fun getting off campus today, though. I, you know, I, I was driving through town thinking, wow, look at all these big buildings. And I, 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 I live in a basement apartment uh, without any windows, and my office is in the Dirksen basement. As a freshman, you, you get these beautiful offices. The ceilings are about six feet tall, and I'm six feet. Um, and, and there are no windows, and we have 21 people in a space about as big as this table. So it's... Um, it's a glamorous life. Thanks to you all. Reprise, uh, first reprise, um, uh, contextually with respect to China, I think four broad trends uh, uh, push the politics, push public perception. First broad trend, acceleration of globalization uh, and the acceleration of global economic integration, which has uh, happened by virtue of technology, and capital flows principally with a lot of um, uh, out uh, a lot of outcomes associated with those two factors in particular technology and money uh, and uh, and first broad trend second is the reemergence of China the integration of Asia around China uh, as the hub uh, 30 years of integration that we've seen driven by geopolitics actually, not by trade agreements in Asia. 
cemented now by trade agreements, but it's a geopolitics that really created the situation you have now among China and its wealthy Asian neighbors. Uh, and the result for China with the meshing of money and technology from the wealthy Asian neighbors and their integration with China's large manpower reserves and very low costs as a poor country uh, has led to uh, an extraordinary uh, reemergence of China uh, in the world. So uh, economically now larger than Japan and Germany. Japan had always been the world's number two largest economy. China is now uh, larger. Uh, robust growth rates over 30 years. Uh, economically resilient. It is now a global driver of growth. Uh, it, is, it has uh, uh, accomplished or solidified the process of regional integration uh, through trade and trade agreements, although, again, that integration was well present before those agreements. What's interesting about that is that China's reemergence has reduced the concentration risk that had always been faced by Asia on their undue dependence on the U.S. market as the market of last resort for exports. So on the one hand, China's reemergence has reduced that concentration risk for the Asian nations. On the other hand, there's some who argue that China's reemergence and the way in which it has gone about its trade relations has uh, unnecessarily increased the dependency of many of these nations on China, giving China additional economic uh, and political heft. Uh, of course, as a general matter, China's political and diplomatic heft is very substantial. They are the Asian agenda center, a setter. This was once unquestioningly the role of Japan. Uh, it, has a, it has accumulated uh, $3 trillion in foreign exchange reserves. That is one-third of the global total of exchange reserves, one-third. This gives China extraordinary flexibility to, among other things, uh, lead a robust going-out strategy, uh, Chinese investment worldwide, most especially directed toward natural resource uh, acquisition. It is a combination of extraordinary reserves as well as very high retained corporate earnings in China that has led to a dramatic increase in China's investments uh, abroad. And this reemergent China has embarked on a series of domestic policy measures uh, that in many instances are at odds with the West. Uh, and this is really um, a function of the other factors in part that I've talked about and China's own form of development. But in any event, what you see in Chinese policy is a desire to rebalance the levers of wealth in China. Moving those levers from, in their view, a multinational corporation dominated economy to an economy that's highly indigenized. To put it slightly differently, the view that foreigners hold too much of what is China's wealth has imbued many of these policies uh, with uh, significant force. So you see high degrees of support of industrial uh, sectors. If you look at the most current draft of the 12th five-year plan, you see real targeting of seven core industries for the future and four trillion RMB uh, uh, allocated to them. Uh, an undervalued currency, which Senator Portman mentioned. The drive toward indigenous innovation in China which meshes intellectual property rights and industrial uh, policy uh, so that market access is conditioned on the disgorging of intellectual property rights or technology. The development of local champions, uh, improved but still weak IP enforcement, mandatory product standards or mandated technologies for use, which uh, puts um, global technologists at a disadvantage, and many other uh, policies. And the outgrowth of all of this is a very disaffected business community 
All the polling data shows this of both the U.S. and EU business community operating in China, highly disaffected, uh, feel discriminated against, and are concerned not so much with profitability today, but what the future bodes. Third uh, major trend that bears on the politics uh, for the U.S., and that is that the uh, increase in global integration generally, the reemergence of China comes at a time of extraordinary economic weakness in the West. This is a very volatile combination. So you have extraordinary global imbalances, which we've all uh, read about, trade imbalances, financial imbalances, uh, trade deficit countries versus uh, versus uh, uh, trade surplus countries, uh, currency issues, competitive non-appreciation of currencies, and all the rest. We see at the same time uh, austerity measures being put in place. UK as one uh, example, France, most of Southern Europe, the US is next on the hit list, there's no question about that. And we see high and persistent levels of unemployment in the West. All of these factors at a time the competition globally has gotten much tougher. And the fourth broad trend uh, is that this competitive environment, the weakening of Western economies generally, has accelerated the disruption of settled industries. Uh, the question was asked uh, about job loss. And if you look at U.S. manufacturing, blue-collar jobs, the process of job uh, loss in manufacturing has been going on for over 40 years in the United States. And Bill, you talked a lot about this, I know. Uh, even during the Clinton administration, the conclusion at that time by the Council of Economic Advisors was about 80 percent of job loss in manufacturing in the U.S. is technology related. It's what economists call the dark side of productivity increases. You just don't need as many workers to produce the same amount of output. And the result is job dislocation. This is a longstanding trend. But there are jobs that are lost as a result of trade and other factors in that remaining 20 percent. And part of this has to do with the lowest two quintiles of the income distribution. And the lowest two quintiles of the income distribution, and Bill knows this better than anybody because he has worked on this for so many years, is also education related. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the education, you stay at the bottom. These, these low, lowest two quintiles are very vulnerable to any form of job dislocation and to reemployment, It is very tough. And that, f for anyone who's ever known anybody out of work, is a heartbreaking phenomenon. Uh, so that's point one. Point two, on the white collar side, which is a somewhat newer phenomenon, the far greater impacts on white collar uh, job uh, loss and job dislocation has to do with the U.S. recession. Uh, and uh, particularly uh, business laying off in that managerial class in very, very large numbers, a process ongoing for a long time as uh, companies have uh, uh, driven cost savings harder and harder. Uh, jobs lost from outsourcing are relatively few, but the feeling, the feeling among uh, people who have lost their jobs, and when you look at the overall unemployment rate, which of course is understated because of a large cache of people who just stopped looking so they're not in the statistics, this creates for the feeling of extraordinary disruption and hostility, and that hostility is turned uh, in, uh, in many, many, uh, in many, many ways. So as we look at these four broad trends, what are their effects? The administration uh, has been spurred to drive, begin to drive a competitiveness agenda. Uh, and this is absolutely critical. If our house isn't in order, I don't care what we do on the trade side. Uh, we are lost. We have to get our house in order. 
there is no excuse for us not to put into place policies which are solely in our control to do to enhance U.S. competitiveness. If you look at what we spend on basic R&D, if you look at in the aggregate R&D spending, if you look at the numbers of labs, if you look at the kids we graduate in what, what are always called my brother always calls the hard subjects, where he excelled, of course, forget me, but the hard <laughs> subjects, right? Physics, chemistry, material science, uh, mathematics. Uh, that's not where our kids are going in at all. These are issues we need to address. We need to address. They are in our control solely, and there is no excuse. And if we don't do it, it won't matter if we pass any trade agreement at this point. So point one, and the administration is now picking up this banner of competitiveness. We'll see what, uh, what comes out of it. The FTA policy, the administration clearly will move forward on Korea. I think there's no question about that. I also think there's no question that will be a broad bipartisan vote, which is a very good thing, uh, and then other domestic policy uh, and international policy priorities. Uh, the effects, though, also of these trends have meant that the, the, the greatest amount of focus uh, center on China and the U.S.-China trade and economic relationship and, frankly, even beyond just trade and economics. Um, and why is that? There's increased head-to-head -head competition. China has moved up the value chain and up the level of sophistication far faster than other countries or we had anticipated. Second, you see a fracturing of the business community. The business community has always been the ballast in the U.S. for stable U.S.-China relations. That business community is disaffected, and there's a fracturing of it. Third, there is a growing weariness on the part of the U.S. and other developing countries as China gains ground. I thought it was remarkable that Brazil joined the U.S. at the G20 with respect to China's currency and putting pressure on China. Uh, it is amazing that actually that happened in the context of the G20, developing country against developing country, uh, using the leverage of the developed countries to help achieve uh, a goal. And, of course, you see intensified uh, trade uh, friction. I don't think that poses an existential threat to the relationship because there are so many mechanisms designed to deal with uh, trade. But uh, I'll conclude by saying the following. Uh, there is no easy answer to the question, what should the U.S. do with China? There is simply no easy answer, and there are so many factors that come into play, including a diminution in the U.S.'s own leverage for our own economic meltdown and for other reasons and our relative positioning globally, which has taken an extraordinary, extraordinary hit, including our ability of moral economic suasion, if you will. Our system just doesn't look so hot to most of the rest of the world. But I think for the U.S., pushing forward vigorously on the China agenda. And I think the administration is just getting its footing, just now getting its footing, on a more robust, more direct China agenda. Um, and whether it's on the government procurement agreement, whether it's on uh, bilateral investment treaty negotiations, whether it's agreements with other Asian uh, nations, which is good in and of itself, but also to correct some of this tilt, uh, whether it is working with third country governments to put pressure, but the U.S. is sometimes too timid, too timid. And having worked with China for 20 years, I just don't see the point of timidity. Uh, on the corporate side, on the corporate side, I would say this. Companies need to speak up. If there's a problem, as a company or industry sector that you face, speak up about it because it won't get better by your silence. And this is a very significant issue for most uh, companies. 
Companies also operating on the ground can help influence the Chinese regulatory process, can influence intellectual property strategies and technology policy strategies. But if you lag back, if you don't act in China the way you act in every other market in the world, which is to say protect your interests vigorously, then you will be left behind. And I'll conclude with that. Okay. <clears throat> well, Meredith, you've got a wonderful audience here today, and I know we want to uh, allow you all to uh, ask some questions, and we're uh, uh, running short of time. So I'll try to uh, speed things up here a little bit if I possibly can. I want to uh, start, uh, Meredith, though, by uh, taking advantage of an opportunity to say something nice about uh, somebody here at CSIS. And I know Ambassador Schwab will join me in this because uh, she and I were in uh, Christchurch, New Zealand a week ago this time, living through an earthquake and diving under uh, uh, tables. And uh, fortunately, we both came out of it alive and we're uh, here to uh, talk to you today. But at the, uh, as we were trying to get out of that uh, country, uh, uh, Ernie Bauer from CSIS did a beautiful piece uh, of how that, uh, uh, that uh, terrible tragedy uh, uh, drew the people uh, of New Zealand and the U.S., at least those who were there, uh, closer together. It was just a, a superb piece and compliments and accolades to CSIS uh, uh, for that. Uh, Ambassador Schwab co-chaired that meeting, by the way, and did her usual uh, outstanding job. Uh, second preliminary comment. Uh, uh, on the question that we had here in the front row on job gains and losses. I think it was Tim Grosser maybe as uh, we were chatting with him in, uh, uh, in New Zealand last week who really summarized that beautifully by just pointing out that job gains from trade are always diffuse, job losses from trade are always specific. Exactly. And that's uh, really the whole heart of the, uh, heart of the issue. Um, and. Uh, uh, and then finally, I have to uh, add a preliminary word on, uh, on these existing trade agreements that have been pending for so long. Uh, I've lived in Colombia, so I have a stronger feeling toward that one than to, uh, toward any of them. And all I would say there is the fact that we've kept our best friend in all of Latin America twisting in the wind for four to five years is just downright shameful. Uh, we need to get that agreement done. It should have been done ages ago. And it doesn't need to be done six months from now or three months from now. It needs to be done now. Uh, and now means immediately. And we need to get off our duffs and, uh, and, and treat our, our friends in this world the way they deserve to be treated. Now, uh, enough of that. Uh, my, my <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Finally, the, uh, my topic for the day is the tra Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And uh, it probably merits uh, you know, half of our time this morning. Uh, we haven't spent a lot of uh, time discussing that agreement here in the U.S. It's kind of floating b below the uh, radar screen, and it needs to be elevated. Uh, this is certainly the most active trade agreement, uh, active trade negotiation we have in the world today. Uh, and it may well represent the wave of the future. Uh, one could certainly hypothesize that plurilateral, plurilateral agreements might well be the wave of the future in contrast to bilateral agreements or multilateral agreements that take a, a decade or more to uh, negotiate. Uh, we at least have an opportunity uh, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which is really a Pacific Rim uh, exercise, um, to open up some excellent market opportunities for the U.S. and a part of the world where we have uh, uh, splendid uh, 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 chances to uh, expand our exports and uh, uh, hopefully uh, over time uh, uh, you know, meet the objectives that have been laid out uh, uh, by President Obama. Uh, this is an exercise that, as most of you know, started out as four countries, not us. We didn't start it. Uh, we joined uh, sort of in the middle. Uh, it's been expanded now to nine. 
uh, with Vietnam and Malaysia being the two, two most recent additions. Uh, and that's a pretty manageable uh, uh, group of countries. It's a, lot heck, a heck of a lot easier to negotiate with uh, uh, a dozen countries or so than it is with 150 uh, in the uh, uh, Doha round in the WTO. Uh, and that's one of the great advantages of, uh, of this uh, uh, agreement. Uh, there has, and, and by the way, Barbara Weissel at USTR, uh, according to everything that I hear, has done a wonderful job of representing the U.S. in, in the negotiation of this agreement uh, uh, thus far. So accolades uh, to her. Uh, there have been some thoughts that we ought to try to get this done by the time of the APEC meetings uh, coming up later this year. President Obama, of course, will host those uh, in Hawaii. Uh, and obviously we want those to be successful uh, and uh, certainly the president wants to, uh, to uh, put his best foot forward uh, at the time those meetings are held. Uh, personally, I don't think it is all at all realistic to expect the agreement to conclude by that time. Uh, uh, my view is that, uh, you know, if you really want an agreement that uh, doesn't say much, uh, you know, go ahead and finish it. Uh, but. Uh, uh, you're going to be pretty embarrassed if you come back home and uh, suddenly figure, people figure out that there's nothing there. Uh, and that may be a, a, an, an overstatement, but the fact is I'd rather wait a, a little while longer and make sure it's darn good uh, than to finish it uh, uh, when it's really uh, uh, fundamentally uh, incomplete. Uh, one reason why that's a uh, 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 somewhat... Uh, a dicey issue at the moment is that the next question or the immediate question is whether Japan joins uh, and that's under a great uh, debate in Japan itself now. Agriculture of course is uh, a significant part of that debate because Japanese agriculture really doesn't want to, uh, uh, want to uh, uh, liberalize as you might expect. Uh, so there's a lot of pushback. Uh, Prime Minister Khan is taking great political risks uh, in Japan today and surfacing that issue and battling it through. His administration may or may not survive, but uh, certainly we need to pat him on the back for having the political courage to take it on uh, as he is now doing. Uh, he has said that he will make a decision on this by June. Uh, I hope he says, yes, I'd like to join because it seems to me it's not only in Japan's best interest in terms of pulling itself out of 20 years of stagnation uh, to join this exercise, but it's also in our interest uh, opening up some excellent uh, export opportunities for the U.S. and Japan, including for U.S. agriculture, uh, a segment of our economy that's not terribly excited about the uh, TPP negotiations at the moment because there isn't much of anything in uh, the TPP negotiations for U.S. agriculture as it's presently constituted. So I'm an advocate of having uh, Japan join in uh, and if we have to have a framework agreement or something to announce in November uh, or some kind of an interim uh, 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 success story uh, at the uh, APEC meetings, uh, and then so be it. Uh, but let's, uh, let's conclude a TPP that truly is a model agreement, a model plurilateral agreement for the world. And we've got an opportunity to do that because not only is this dis uh, a negotiation uh, uh, including all of the, the traditional elements of a trade negotiation, but there's a lot of good work being done on trade facilitation as there has been uh, in the Doha round, uh, and there's work on, regulat uh, on some regulatory coherence, uh, which is badly needed, particularly in the sanitary, phytosanitary area, mm -hmm. uh, and some really good work, advanced work on intellectual property, and, and more work on investment than, uh, than has traditionally gone into trade agreements. So there are a lot of good things happening in the TPP negotiations. And all of us ought to begin to pay more attention to those no negotiations uh, uh, than we have thus far. Uh, will other countries be added? Who knows? Probably nothing beyond Japan, uh, although uh, personally I'd love to see Indonesia in, uh, and I suspect uh, President Obama would, uh, would like to have that happen too since he spent part of his life in Indonesia. That may or may not be feasible, and if it isn't, uh, so be it. Uh, but there are other countries in Asia that could be added uh, to at some point. 
maybe not in this first tranche of the negotiations or in the first agreement that is reached, but uh, the hope is that if this agreement is done really, really well, uh, that it will then have bolt-on possibilities. Uh, it's what I call bolting on additional countries at a later time with a relatively short negotiation being needed because of the quality of the agreement that is presented to them. Uh, it seems to me that there is a really good chance uh, of having that be the outcome of the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations, and we as a nation ought to provide the leadership uh, to try to make that happy. Uh, thank you at this point, and Bill, wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> um, I learned a long time ago, uh, courtesy of the people that worked for me, that associating with people who are smarter than you are is a, a good way to make some progress. So I'm up here to, to get uh, some advantage by being with people that I have great respect for. There's nothing that has been said that I don't agree with. So I want to back off of some of the specifics and try to see and think out loud with you on why this is such an intractable problem. Uh, Charlene mentioned the, uh, the pace of change. I'd like to start by saying that may be the largest single problem we've got. Because when things are moving so fast, whether it's in the nation or in your state or in your community or just in your business, uh, it's hard to keep up. It creates a climate of uncertainty. And using the old uh, uh, political uh, rule, if you if you got a problem and you want to find somebody to blame, do it, but be sure they don't live in your district. <laughs> um, think about that because it's not off the track. What do we do when we have a problem with job losses? Now, we blame Japan. I was there. Uh, we blamed Japan in, in spades, and it took us quite a while to realize that maybe Japan wasn't the problem after all. They, they bought Rockefeller Center and found out it wasn't very good buy. Uh, so, a friend of mine sold it to him. <laughs> and, and you probably got a commission. <laughs> so, if, if the change, pace of change, is, as been said, uh, largely based on technology, that translated means productivity. I don't think I've ever seen a study that doesn't show the losses, the shifting of economic forces from uh, productivity wasn't a factor of many fold over any competition from overseas. So don't blame the Chinese, don't blame the French, don't blame somebody else for the fact that uh, things are getting better in terms of our productivity. Uh, I've never heard an American say we ought to have less of that. If that's true, and if that's putting a stress on us as a people, but we don't know how to recognize and deal with it, we want to be very sure that we don't find somebody else to blame that diverts us from solving the fundamental problem. Look at how many plants have come into the United States and ask yourself why. Why did Volkswagen land, uh, put a plant in my hometown of Chattanooga? Why did Honda go to Ohio, pick on Rob State? Look around this country, you will see a stunning number of investments in the United States, in manufacturing. I happen to believe manufacturing is central to our economic well-being. If they're coming in, why? They're coming here. We, we, we're such a terrible country. Why would they be coming here? Well, if you ask them the question, the first thing that most of them say is that the area they're moving to has a skill base of workers that they can use. 
high skill. Then they talked about the uh, talk about the, uh, the the climate, the welcoming climate. Most importantly, of course, they're talking about access to the U.S. market, largest market in the world. I'm sorry, the president's calling me here. I think. <laughs> <laughs> you typed that just right, Bill. <laughs> He's not in. <laughs> I'm sorry. the the um, The thing, the point is that we we it's very easy to blame somebody else for what's going on. It's it's really more important that we say, what do we need to do? to make sure that we solve the, the fundamental problem. Well, I'd like to suggest uh, a couple of things that we can think about. First, in terms of international agreements, uh, the reason for a World Trade Organization, uh, in my judgment, when we were trying to put something together that went beyond tariffs on goods, we wanted to include services, intellectual property, investments, is that a global agreement gives you political cover to do things that you might not be able to do at home that you should do. You know you ought to do it, but if you have an agreement that says we're all going to make some sacrifices, we're all going to do some things, it makes it a lot easier to do at home. I don't think you can stop at looking at the international global thing like Doha, but to pick up on the second. Thing. I wouldn't argue Colombia. I don't think anybody here disagrees with that. But I do want to agree with, with Clayton on, on TPP and, and, and the process that, that that represents because it could be a different way of creating coalitions. Uh, when I was at USTR, we created the, group, the Quad Group because we had four partners that would pretty well govern the, the world trade, organ, uh, trade process, the Quad Group. Uh, we went and created a second group called the Real Group in which we brought together trade and finance ministers because I said, you know, we really have a mutuality of interest and we need the finance guys. The only, only treasury in the, United, in the world that didn't participate out of those group of 17 countries was the U.S. Treasury. They didn't want to dirty their hands with the grabby little business of trade. And somebody actually said that to me. Um, we have got to have the financial and the trade people on the same team. Otherwise, we'll spend all of our time arguing over which has the, the priority, which is doing the better job. That's a waste. Uh, I, the last thing I want to say about the international, we have forgotten some of our friends. One of the best allies we've got in the world is Japan. We're not, we're not bringing them into the process. We very much need that voice. We haven't done near enough with some other opportunity areas like Brazil. But I really would like to, to, to leave the, on the table the fact that we haven't had a stronger trade ally, with the exception of agriculture, anywhere than the Japanese. And they could make an enormous contribution to this uh, conversation. Last, let me come back to the to the domestic composition of a of a support group. I, I I've been having I'm I'm a nut on education reform. I've been having some meetings lately uh, with business leaders on one side and uh, union leaders on the other. The pitch being that it is con conceivable that we can address the the education issue in the United States unless we have both parties at the table. We, we, we spend all our time fighting each other. If we're going to solve some of these issues, we can't do it by beating up on the other side. Uh, in this case, uh, in most cases actually, in the Congress, for example, it's uh, labor. Well, they got a stake in this thing. Isn't there some way that we can create a different quality of conversation? For example, what is it that we can do with labor at the table that makes the United States more attractive for domestic manufacturing? What can we do to make it more attractive for inward investment? 
Okay, let's start with the fact that we're not doing half a job in education in this country we've got to do. We're doing, not doing half the job in terms of workforce improvement, skill development that we could be doing. If we do those things, that would make us more attractive. We've got, as, as Rob Portman says, the highest corporate tax rate in the world. We've lost our mind. If we want to compete, we've got to compete in every aspect of the cost of doing business. That means our skill base, it means our tax base, it means our regulatory base, uh, it means the whole uh, climate around which we decide to compete. So um, I'm not drawing away from the, <clears throat> from the specific conversation that we've had because they, I, I agree with everything that's been said. But I do want us to start thinking about how we compose a political alliance between people who have been too often adversaries to the disadvantage of both. And if we can start that kind of a conversation, uh, I think we can make an enormous amount of progress. Thank you very much. Uh, Sherm Katz, Center for, Studying, Center for Study of the Presidency. Uh, a, an ambassador in Geneva from a major South American country said to me, you know, it doesn't appear to us that like most other important economies in the world, the United States comes with a trade scenario which incorporates thinking about U.S. comparative advantages. And um, we know that uh, we have democratic processes, we have uh, cultural traditions that make it very difficult to, uh, for USTR or anyone else in government to say, here, here are the industries of the future. But in part, that's what we're competing with uh, in, in other countries. And I just wonder whether any of the folks in this panel have any thoughts about how we grapple with that issue. I think, Sherm, uh, I would just start that by saying that I think you've got to let the marketplace uh, determine the uh, uh, industries of the future. Uh, Japan tried this uh, in Miti, uh, uh, de determining what the uh, industries of the future were, and they fell flat on their faces uh, about 25 years ago. Uh, and now you've got uh, people who are arguing that, uh, uh, you know, uh, energy is uh, energy industries, uh, climate change related industries uh, are the wave of the future. And uh, I noticed that uh, uh, the European Union, uh, who had put which had put some uh, money and uh, uh, and tax benefits and so on into that area, uh, is now finding a whole slew of those entities uh, going into bankruptcy. Uh, so it seems to me that uh, you know throwing government money. Uh, at a time when we've got a, a trillion and a half dollar deficit at potential industries of the future that uh, may be big losers is probably not the best use of tax funds at the moment. I would simply say that <clears throat> where the U.S. has always excelled, uh, and it has been the root of much of our economic success, is our extraordinary capacity with respect to basic scientific research, basic research. Uh, this has always been our ace in the hole. It is why, it is what in many ways our university system, particularly at the graduate and postgraduate postdoc level, are aimed toward extremely high functioning, very creative uh, individuals who pursue uh, all sorts of different forms of research. Uh, the, uh, the U.S., I think the President has recognized this, has got to return to the era when we put a lot of U.S. dollars into basic research. It can be through the universities and others. But this is where we excel as a country, uh, and this is where we are falling down as a country. And so rather than pick and choose industries, 
because uh, quite right, we're all aware of Michael Porter's fabulous work at Harvard on the meaty catastrophes in Japan, rather than pick and choose, giving companies the ability to utilize basic scientific research that's been done, uh, which might be sector specific or not. Many universities channel these things into sectors and so on, uh, would be extremely, I think, an extremely important contribution. Thank you. Um, Charlotte, if you could maybe get us into a Doha conversation. Thank you. Charlotte Hebebrand, International Food and Agricultural Trade Policy Council. I have one DOA question and one TPP. Uh, first of all, congratulations, fantastic panel. So uh, uh, good job, CSIS and, and Meredith. Um, my, my TPP question is this. I think Charlene Barshevsky gave a brilliant uh, discussion of uh, sort of the rise of China and what all that means. Could you, uh, uh, Clayton Yider, put that into the TPP context for us? So, so what's the Chinese issue in the TPP? Are, are, do we want to bring them on to this negotiation in the future? Is this the U.S. attempt to sort of try to strengthen ties with, uh, with Chinese neighbors? Explain that uh, maybe if you could. Um, the Doha round, it uh, seems to me, is dead from what you have said, uh, unless we can pass this Portman-Lieberman bill very, very quickly. Um, and I've heard several of you say that maybe plurilateral uh, agreements are the way to go in the future. Is that true for agriculture, uh, which I think in some issues is really, yes, you can tackle it bilaterally and regionally, but can you really get at things like uh, subsidies uh, in, in, in a bilateral and plurilateral context? Thank you. I suppose I should uh, try that because I uh, did the TPP discussion, uh, uh, but uh, on agriculture, uh, no, that's a uh, that's really a global issue, and uh, uh, although uh, you know agriculture will clearly be dealt with in the context of the TPP, and I think can be dealt with successfully there, uh, including Japanese agriculture. What I told the Japanese on that subject, by the way, is that. Uh, uh, yeah, it, although agriculture is, di is a difficult problem in the context of TPP, it's not an impossible problem. Uh, and I used our European U Union friends as an example uh, where for many years they said the common agricultural policy was sacrosanct and could never be, cha be changed. And uh, lo and behold, uh, about 20 years ago at the conclusion of, of the Uruguay round, they began to change it. and, be, and uh, uh, actually, over the last uh, 20 years, they probably have done more reforming of agriculture than we have, uh, even although they started for, from a uh, lower base, if you will, so they still have uh, a little bit further to go. Uh, and my comment to the Japanese was, uh, you know, take it on in the context of the TPP uh, and uh, do some of the reforms that you absolutely have to do in any case uh, and get some credit for it uh, in the negotiating environment for uh, for doing what is absolutely critical uh, in Japan in any case. Uh, with respect to, uh, to uh, China, I don't see China joining the uh, uh, the TPP negotiations. Uh, I doubt that that's practical in, uh, uh, at this stage for a whole variety of reasons, political and economic. But if we have a really good TPP agreement involving, uh, you know, 10 or 11 or 12 countries, uh, then I think it, uh, it becomes feasible to add China at a later time. That would require an additional negotiation, of course, because of the complexities of the Chinese economy. But it would be a whole lot easier than starting from scratch. And so I could see uh, China coming into the picture uh, at... Uh, 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 in the future, uh, and uh, I can see the same thing happening with a number of other uh, uh, Asian countries. Uh, and gee, with the explosion of demand that's occurring in that part of the world, with maybe 400 million people being added as uh, middle income consumers in Japan and maybe close to that in India, um, the opportunities for an e economic interchange um, uh, within the TPP area are just enormous. But the TPP does what I was trying to say earlier. It would give Japan the political cover to do what Japan knows it's got to do. Right. And that's a huge opportunity for them and for us in terms of growing this process. If I could make just one comment on the intersection of bilateral or plurilateral free trade agreements and Doha. Putting aside for a moment the importance of agriculture to the developing world, which is 
uh, mm -hmm. absolutely clear and huge. Uh, <clears throat> and the questions that will remain even if the U.S. and Japan and Europe and Korea reduce substantially ag subsidies, which, as was pointed out, are sanitary and phytosanitary measures, which are also barriers if countries can't come up to those standards. And that's a whole separate issue. Putting aside agriculture, there's actually only one reason I want to see Doha conclude, and it is a defensive reason. Most free trade agreements in the world, most, are glorified tariff agreements. That's what they are. That's right. They don't handle services in any meaningful way. Many exclude agriculture or only partially deal with agriculture. They don't include investment. They don't include IP. They don't include any of the new areas. So if you're thinking defensively for the administration, you want Doha to conclude because if you get global tariffs way down, and if you have a robust program of zeroing out tariffs, you disarm the discriminatory effect of the hundreds and hundreds of existing free trade agreements. Now, in my view, that is no substitute for a robust trade policy and a robust policy of doing these far more expanded agreements, these model agreements like TPP. But it would certainly help to alleviate in one fell swoop some of the more serious examples of discrimination and market share loss faced by U.S. companies. Let me just add on the Doha round. Um, I think there's no question but a global agreement permits uh, nations to do under the umbrella, including our own, uh, things that they find politically difficult to do. And I agree with uh, Charlene. There is a defensive aspect. But there's also a very positive aspect. And when people say to me, there's not much on the table for Doha, I really worry about it. I remember back to the Marshall Plan, where markets were devastated, and the United States reached out and helped open markets, and thereby invested in the future, created markets for ourselves. Just imagine if we were to bring in uh, into a real participation in trade, the poorest nations that have huge, huge uh, populations, it would make a difference. And because we have negotiated over the last 60 years on issues of the industrialized countries, we need to, as a global matter, begin to address the issues of those who were not at the table. It seems strange to me that we have a 48 percent tariff on cheap uh, tennis shoes. We don't make cheap tennis shoes. We don't save any jobs from people making cheap tennis shoes. Who do we hurt? We hurt the folks that have to buy at pennies in our own market who don't have a job but do need shoes. And we hurt the people in Bangladesh that make those cheap tennis shoes. Now, this makes no sense. Were we to bring Bangladesh in and address some of these issues, we would create not only markets for the future, but we would create goodwill on the political and strategic end of the, uh, of, the, of the realm. And I think it is just critical. Besides that, Doha is the only organization having a world trade organization that can resolve disputes. And I'll just end. If we didn't have WTO, we would all be governed by the law of the jungle. And believe me, the WTO is better. May, may I uh, just add uh, w one thing? Uh, and it really is, I suppose, a cautionary note. And that is, when you look at the mass of the developing world, you look at rates of poverty, and you look at the age of the average age of the population, what you have is a macrocosmic view of what's going on now in the Middle East among countries with a very young, very restless, disaffected population, high rates of unemployment, poverty, hunger, corrupt regimes. And the notion that we would view unilaterally opening our market to assist this 
broad range of countries for our greater good, never mind the moral issues and all the, our greater good, to ensure greater stability, to build the markets Carl is talking about, which is what we did with the devastated Europe after the war, is breathtaking to me, completely breathtaking to me. And I dare say, if the question before the Congress today were, should there be a Marshall Plan, number one, it would never get to the floor, and number two, it would never have passed. And or, that is a very sad commentary. Or Bretton Woods. Or Bretton Woods. Or, or any the Gat. Or any of the rest. Hang on. We've lost our minds. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, Shirley. On that note, <laughs> yeah, I'm getting the hook here. Um, want to thank, join me in thanking a terrific panel that leaves us wanting more. Every, everyone, please stay in your seats while we let these guys get off this very narrow panel and out to the elevators. <laughs>